You have now released three books for Christmas and uh, these books are directed uh, to uh, children, ankle biters as you call them, to uh, teens is the second one and then you've got one in relation to young people and uh, dare I say wrinklies. Uh, tell us about what those books are for and what, why, why different ones for different ages? I've written a number of books on climate and as a result, I have been cancelled. As a result, I've lost friends. As a result, I've had great fractures in the family. Uh, but uh, they regard me as controversial because I speak the truth and use facts. So be it. Uh, my concern is that young children are being fed propaganda at the schools. They're not being taught how to think. They're not being taught how to be critical thinkers. And the concept of knowledge is absolutely and totally beyond them. So the first book is for ankle biters, and that's for eight to 12 year olds. And it's about climate change and about net zero. And it's a real challenge to write to kids that age to get complex scientific concepts over to them. So I really only tried one concept, and that is you eat. And when you eat, uh, and I had them eating cookies, I used the American word deliberately, um, I had them eating cookies, and they have to know where they come from. And so I went into how you need wheat and how you grow wheat and how you need fossil fuels uh, to grow your wheat and to transport your wheat and to make your bread or make your cookies, and then that is a carbon-rich compound, the cookie that you eat, and you convert that into a number of waste products, and you also use some of it to grow. One of the waste products is the carbon dioxide that you breathe out, and that's 100 times as much as you breathe in. Another one is poo, wee, and farts. And I go into farts quite a bit because <laughs> eight-year-old kids just roll around in spasms of laughter about farts. And they're chemically quite interesting. And, and so I, I basically tell the kids that if you have net zero, you don't eat and you don't fart and you're going to die. So uh, it's, it's meant to entertain the kids, but it gets a, a message over. And for the next book, that's for 12 to 16-year-old kids uh, and that's for teens. And teenagers moan and groan, oh, it's not fair, oh, there's nothing to eat. Well, I go into some of the facts and figures about who eats what around the world and how you, you eat because of fossil fuels. And I go into some of the um, bogus science that they're fed. I look at how many hurricanes we've had over the last 100 years, how many wildfires we've had, uh, what's happened with storms. Um, and I go into all of the major issues that they've been taught and some of them are suffering emotionally from this. And to show the facts give you a different story, it's wrong. When you look at temperature, it's within variability. There's nothing special. But then I point out to the kids that you are living in such a wonderful period of time because at this period of time that you're in, it's very rare that people live in these times, everyone's gone nuts. And the last period of time when everyone went nuts was in the 17, uh, 1600s, and we had the Dutch tulip craze when people were spending twice their annual wage on buying a single bulb, and that bubble burst. And we've gone nuts regarding plant food and energy. But the best example of that is in the uh, 1600s, we had the witch hunts, and that was the absolute peak of cold times. That was in the Maunder minimum. And we had crop failure after crop failure. People starved and the community had to blame someone. So they blamed women and they had witch hunts and they old, killed the old witches. Women. So I've got, old women, wasn't it? Old women were witches. And so I've got a graph showing the number of witches that were killed plotted against temperature. And as soon as we came out of the Maunder minimum and temperature started to rise, which has stopped, stopped getting killed. So the argument I'm putting up, which is one of scientific thinking, is that killing witches uh, changes the climate. And uh, obviously we see it, just look at the graph. So uh, the kids realise, of course, that's silly. And I'm trying to show that we have um, illogical reasoning in today's world, the same as we've had in the past. So you're very lucky to live in these times. But I also point out that if you're 
swanning around in an electric vehicle, feeling morally superior to others, this vehicle uses cobalt. That cobalt is mined by kids your age in the Congo who are getting poisoned by the cobalt, who are getting killed in rock falls in open pits and underground. So you feel superior because you're driving around in an electric car thinking you're saving the planet. When, and by doing that, you're killing kids your age. You tell me what's fair about that. And the third book is a book for um, people in the later teens and 20s and wrinklies, and it's basically a book on the history of the planet and showing that we've had six great ice ages. And each time we started one of those ice ages, we had more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than now. So carbon dioxide, plant food, it couldn't be driving global warming. I look at the five great mass extinctions and how none of them were related to climate change. I look at the great fluctuations in sea level, and for most of time it's been warmer and wetter than now, and we've had much higher sea levels. I look at sea level changes, and in the past they've been up to 600 metres, up and down. So I use the past to try to get a perspective on the present, and then I go into um, the fact that we've come up with this crazy idea that human emissions of carbon dioxide drive global warming. The end result of that is that we have uh, wind and solar energy and to develop wind energy, we need to cut down balsa wood forests in the, Brazil to make the laminated blades. We need to use chemicals such as bisphenol A um, in the epoxies. These are braid out of the blades. Uh, these are highly toxic chemicals that go into the soils. We can't recycle those blades. We cut them up, we bury them and contaminate soils and waterways. I look at the killing of wildlife, uh, birds, especially the raptors, uh, bats, insects, which is um, bird food and um, bat food, and the killing of whales offshore by having wind turbines. I look at how these things are there forever. There is no mechanism whereby you can actually clean up after the mess you've made. Now I look at solar panels, how solar panels are made by slave labour in China, how these contaminate the soils with cadmium and tellurium and selenium uh, and, and lead and how these leach out all the time. If you have a, have a decent hailstorm, you actually contaminate the ground and that's forever. So I look at the mad policies that have evolved from having this false hypothesis and I end up Having a look at electric cars, how they consume about seven times as much metal as a conventional car, uh, how they've got uh, very high insurance, high probability of catching a light, very short range, and how totally and absolutely inappropriate they are for a, an island continent like Australia. But if you want to swan around feeling morally superior in the cities, then you're going to find that you won't be able to plug this into an apartment block. These were built not to have cars plugged in consuming power. You won't be allowed soon to be able to transport that ship on a ferry, because uh, that car on a ferry, because they catch a light and we've had a boat sink because of it. You won't be able to put that into a car park because car parks now no longer will be insured to have electric cars. So I look at the realities of this wonderful saving the planet policies, and that's in the third book. So this trilogy of books is, is written in a humorous style with a lot of information, and it's written uh, for grandparents and parents to try to reprogram their kids from all the nonsense that they've been fed at school.